Matthew chapter 16. Uh, We will begin in verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. From that time, and you remember the context if you were here last week of where we are in this story, that we've just had the confession of Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and this would be a foundational moment in the building of his church. And now that they've got their heads around that concept, he can say a little bit more about what's coming. Uh, It's interesting to me that he says that he must go. I don't know what are the musts for you in life, but I think sometimes we, uh, we mistake our, our musts or our wants and our needs and get all those things lumped together sometimes, and they're very different things, but he must go. This is something he must do. This is part of the plan. Sometimes I wish we had a few more musts in our lives, a few more things that we felt that were just absolute, or if not, that they were at least the right things. I think a lot of our musts tend to fall in line with our daily work. I I must do this thing, I must complete this project, I must be there for this. And I've heard so many times people say, you know, if you stopped working there tomorrow, they would hire someone else to do your job. Or if they didn't, that might be even a worse sign that your job wasn't really all that necessary in the first place. I think sometimes we feel like it all comes back to us. And we get so caught up on things, and yet with Jesus here, we see that this is part of the task that has been set forth from the beginning. This is the way the plan was going to go. He was going to come to earth, and he knew before leaving heaven that this would not end well on earth. He knew that it was going to be a difficult thing. He knew that it was going to be a task that was unpleasant, but yet he knew that he must go. Continuing in verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, before we even finish this verse, this picture amazes me every time I think about it. He took Jesus aside, who just a few verses before, he has acknowledged, Peter, same guy, that this is the Messiah, and this is the Son of God, and now Jesus says something that he's not quite in full agreement with, and he takes him aside. Now, I appreciate, on the one hand, that he does take him aside. I'm not always good at taking aside someone. Sometimes I'm a little better at the uh, public dressing down and the just going off on somebody, whoever is around, it doesn't matter because I've got to say what has to be said. We had a Christmas a couple years ago. I can tell this story because my wife's not here. She's actually let me tell it before, so it's okay. We had a Christmas a couple years ago where we were going to see a movie uh, with all the in-laws. I was in Nebraska in uh, not my own territory. We're going along. It's about a half hour drive to the closest theater. And we're driving along, trying to make the decision of what we're going to see and when we're going to see it between two cars via cell phone with a spotty signal. All I want to know is what the plan is. I I need information. I need to know where I'm driving. I need to know what I'm seeing. I need to get my mind set where it needs to go. And no one will make a decision. Or if they are, it's getting broken up in signal. And we finally get there, and I still don't know what we're doing. And we get inside the theater, and no one knows what we're doing. And my wife and I are getting a little bit tense happens once in a while. And so we are in the foyer of this movie theater uh, in Nebraska. They have lots of wind, uh, and it's cold in the wintertime, and so they've, in a lot of these places, built in a little foyer where you come in a certain set of doors from the outside, and then there's a little entryway, and then another set of doors. We're in the in-between. All of the in-laws are inside looking at tickets and all those things, and my wife and I are arguing. My wife and I are actively, heatedly arguing, and we are going back and forth, and it's a dumb argument about nothing that is all that important, and at one point, I glance out of the corner of my eye, and I can see my in-laws all lined up (laughs) inside the movie theater watching us, and what they see at that moment is me, something like this, they can't hear any of it because of the glass that separates us. And I remember going through that whole experience thinking to myself, we probably shouldn't have done this here. (laughs) If we were going to do this, this should have happened in the car, just the boys be witnesses to it. Or maybe if I were smart, this shouldn't have happened at all, and I should just go along and be happy I'm seeing a movie of some kind, get some popcorn and sit and be entertained. 
But instead, we have this argument there in front of everybody. Peter at least has the tact to pull Jesus aside. And I think we can learn something from that, but then also learn the negative side of this, which is, he says, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. What shall never happen to you? The thing you've just said is going to happen to you. The thing you've just said that you must do. <clears throat> this is not what they had in mind. Now, Peter gets the blame for being the one with the guts to say it sometimes, but I'm going to guess there is a group of disciples standing there that are all thinking this. We've followed you to this point, and what we have in mind is not for our leader to die. We followed you to this point, and if Peter was right a few verses back, and you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God, then why would these chief priests and the teachers of the law and all these folks that are against you, who somewhere along in the course of time your father put in the place that they are in, why would they be the one that lead you to your death? It doesn't make any sense. And as they tried to process all of this, it did not make human sense to them. And I will tell you, if you have not run into something like this with God yet, you will. I stand in a parking lot where someone has fallen getting out of their car, and I watched this whole medical scene unfolding, and I think to myself, she's trying to go worship this morning. And here she lays waiting for a paramedic. One of my best friends in life, uh, who was my youth minister growing up, had a severe accident where his car was T-boned by someone who ran a red light as they were on their way to church. His wife, still today, 25 years later, walks with a limp as a result of that accident. She had almost all of the blood in her body replaced during the first day in the hospital. Incredible recovery that she had to go through. And I would see that, that whole thing and think, they were on their way to church that morning. There are things about the walk with God that will throw us off. There are things about God himself that we will try to understand that we cannot completely understand. Why would a God who knew all this would happen the way it would happen create all of this in the first place? There are a lot of things we cannot fully wrap our heads around. And these disciples, even though they have Jesus standing right in front of them, this does not fit the mold of what they have in mind. And so Peter, gutsy, dumb, foot in mouth, whatever you might think of it, rebukes him. And I appreciate he's willing to say what the others are thinking, and at the same time, I wonder how many times the, the things that we think may come across this way to God. God, it can't be this way. God, this thing that, that is sin, when we read about it here, but does not fit where we're at culturally, it can't be that way. I can't explain it. God, this, this challenge that has come our way in our lives, this, this is not okay. It can't be like this. We say this kind of thing to God a lot in life. Jesus turns to Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Now, I don't know what response Peter was expecting from Jesus. I would pretty much guarantee you this was not it. To see Satan at work in what he's doing? Wait, I'm the guy who just said who you were. Just a few verses back. I'm the rock. On the rock, you're going to build this church. On the foundation of what, that, what I've said, you're, this, is, this is it. I, I figured it out when nobody else could. And now you're saying, get behind me, Satan. And he very quickly goes from being a rock to being a stumbling block. And each one of us sitting here could very easily do the same thing. Now, the beauty of the gospel is... We could also flip this slide upside down. And you can very quickly, going from being a stumbling block in someone's life or in the work of the church, to being a rock. You can very quickly go from being someone who seems to be in the way, as Peter is in this case, to someone who is helping things move forward. Or maybe you can go very quickly from someone who does not feel incredibly important in what we do, to someone who is doing something amazing. I watched that in the parking lot too. I watched Debbie and I watched Ruth being nurses out there. And I thought to myself, man, I'm glad we have nurses here. I'm glad there are people that know what to do. And I think each one of us brings something like that to the table where we know what to do. We know what we can bring to the kingdom. And for Peter, it is his mouth a lot of the time, but because of that, it's also a challenge to use his mouth in the right way. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. 
And that's where we find ourselves so much of the time because it is what is right in front of us. I will admit to you, getting up here this, this morning, and you can tell because I've referenced it twice, I'm having a hard time getting out of my head what I saw in the parking lot. I'm having a hard time getting out of my head the human side of who we are. Uh, I have a hard time getting out of my head that my wife is not feeling well this morning and I had to leave because I have something that I had to do here. We all have stuff during the course of a week that we have a hard time letting go of. We all have stuff during the course of a week that we have a hard time not focusing in on instead of God and what he's going to do. These disciples were no different. They saw in front of them not just a teacher, but at this point in their relationship, I think a friend. And a friend who is telling them that he is going to have to die for this, and they are not okay with that. And Jesus, who is going to have to suffer all this, who may be an out of this doesn't sound so bad some days, instead says to them, you can't focus in on the human things. You have to focus in on something else, something that's bigger than that. Then Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Disciple. It's an interesting word that we don't use in a whole lot of contexts other than, than religious ones. But quite literally, it's someone who follows. And some of us have an easier time following than others. Peter struggles a little bit with the idea of following. He, he follows Jesus, but at the same time, he has so many times that he wants to step out front because he has a better idea or a different idea or a better way. But Jesus gives us the key here in this verse to discipleship. Uh, I had a preacher one time. The first time I preached a full-length sermon, uh, I was a youth intern in Valdosta, Georgia in the summer of 1994. The preacher was going to be out of town, and it fell to me. And I was excited and nervous all at the same time. And I said to him, I, I lived with the preacher's family during that summer, I said to him, how, how do you figure out what you're going to talk about? Because I have kind of an idea, but I don't really know where to go with it. And he, uh, I showed him the verse that I was thinking of, of running from, and he said, you know, a lot of times if you will look at the verse, the outline is already there. And I think this is one of those places where we find that, where we find Jesus brings up this idea of discipleship and then tells us how it works, which is they begin by denying themselves. Very difficult thing to do in our culture. Deny yourself. Because the culture around us does not operate that way. The culture around us is about self. The culture around us is about climbing higher and stepping on whoever you have to to get there. The culture around us wants more, bigger, nicer, better. And Jesus says, no, d deny yourself. Deny yourself and take up your cross. Now they are beginning to have their eyes open to the idea he's going to die. I don't think that they are quite yet to how he's going to die. But the idea of someone taking up a cross is very, very real to them. Uh, we live in a world, or at least in our nation we do, uh, where we talk about things like cruel and unusual punishment, and that's a negative. In the Roman world, that, that's a starting point. That's what you wanted to do. You wanted to not just execute people, but you wanted to do it in a very memorable kind of way so that everyone around would see the example. And so not only would they hang people on these crosses, but they would give these men or women who were on their way to be executed sometimes a piece of the cross to carry, sometimes the whole thing. And so you would see people walking through the city square carrying this lumber on their back, and you knew what was about to happen to them. And the idea of taking up a cross, not a pleasant thought. This is the amazing part of this whole story with Jesus talking about discipleship, where he's not selling you on the good side yet. He's being very frank and open with us about, this is not always going to be easy. And there are going to be times where it is downright hard. But he says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And for Peter, that's a very big piece of this whole puzzle. You've got to let go of what you think this should be, and you've got to follow. And for us, I think we have that same struggle sometimes. We think we know better. And we've got to follow. In verse 26, he says, What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? What really matters? What really matters? And I think there are things on earth that really matter. 
And generally speaking, those things are people. People on earth matter. And like Roy referenced for us this morning, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That's how much he cares about people, and we should care about people in the same way. But beyond people, what here really matters, I think his church matters an awful lot. And then as we begin to get further and further away from those things, we start to realize that a lot of that stuff just doesn't matter. You walk into my apartment today and you make a left into my bedroom and then you make a right into my closet. What you will find in my closet are too many clothes hanging up, a shelf, and then above that shelf are bin after bin after bin stacked all the way to the ceiling of clothes that do not fit. (laughs) And I have sizes to choose from should I continue to ride my bike as much as I need to. And I keep those things thinking to myself, they will fit again. Now, the sad thing is they will fit again and they'll be terribly out of style, but they will fit again. I have a hard time letting go of stuff sometimes. I have a hard time letting go of things I want to do, experiences I want to have. I have a hard time making the things that are unimportant, important. And yet sometimes... I realize that the stuff that I worry so much about doesn't really matter all that much. These disciples find themselves in the same place as that. It's in a hurry trying to get things done one day this week. David, my son, walks from uh, Cal Young Middle School down Holly Street, crosses North Kenzie, and comes here every afternoon. I got a text about midway through his walk that he was stopping at Leland and Beth's house to see if Leland needed help with anything. And I thought to myself for just a moment, kind of ready to go home. And then I thought to myself, how cool is that? And he sees something that really matters. And I probably also sees he might get to use a drill, and that's cool. But he sees something that matters, people. I don't know what you came in here worried about today. Whether it's work things, whether it's house stuff, whether it's debt, I will tell you that although we have to keep up with those things and that's part of life, those are not the things that matter. When things do not go exactly according to our plan, those are not the things that matter. And what Jesus says here is you can gain the whole world and there are people out there that are trying desperately to do that. But if you lose your soul, it does not matter. For the Son of Man, is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Now, he has walked us all the way through everything that's going to be difficult and hard to bear and carrying crosses and denying yourself, and then he gets to the reward because he knows us, and he knows these kinds of things matter. So not only do we need to know the road's going to be difficult, but when you get to the end of that road, there is a reward like you cannot imagine. And the question for us this morning is, are we living that way? Are we living in the kind of way that says the things eternal are what is important to us? Paul would put it in this way when he talks about the sacrifice of Jesus. You see that just at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We matter that much to him, and I hope we live in such a way that says that he matters that much to us. This morning, if you're struggling with what things matter, where your priorities ought to be, uh, we're probably several of us in that same boat. We have times that we get it right, and other times that we get things out of focus. This morning, if you would like to tell him for the first time that he matters more than anything to you, and you'd like to take him on a baptism, this morning, if there are things we can pray about as a church or something that you need to share, whatever needs you may have this morning, please come as we stand and sing.